Today we're talking about pre-meal prayer. Very confusing subject. A lot of people don't know when to pray, what to pray for, how to pray, who prays. Or, hey, do you want me to, should I pray? You wanna, should we pray? I don't know if, all very confusing. We're gonna cover it all today. Let's get started. Chips and salsa. Sometimes they bring it to the table before you're even seated. There's no need to pray for that. Lots of people wonder about appetizers. Do you pray for them? Do you not pray for them? No prayer is necessary for an appetizer if you have entrees coming out later. Salad, that is the most confusing thing on the prayer continuum. If it's a side salad or an appetizer salad, no need for prayer there. Now, if it's a main course salad or you're bringing it out with the rest of everyone else's meal, that then is gonna require some kind of prayer. But I put that kind of in a separate category. For the most part, when you're thinking about salads, just remember this, if it requires dressing, it doesn't require a blessing. Soup, do you pray for soup? Do you not pray for soup? It's only bowl-related soups. Anything smaller than that is always off the hook. I like to say if it comes in a cup, no need to lift up. Everyone knows if you order a hamburger, that's going to require prayer. But if you order sliders, that does not require prayer. It's a little glitch in the system a lot of people are not aware of. Potato skins, no prayer. Baked potato, prayer. Last but certainly not least, who at the table volunteers to lead the prayer? Lots of people say the man should lead the prayer. Why is that? I'm not sure. It's 2018. Maybe we should get that rule adjusted at some point in the near future. A lot of people operate under the most spiritual person at the table. They're going to be the one that should pray because that prayer is going to be the most powerful and effective. So if you got obviously a pastor, a missionary, even a Christian blogger of some sort, shoot, even a volunteer youth pastor, that prayer is going to be a little less effective, but it's still going to qualify. If you're just an average person sitting at the table with obviously more spiritual people around you, you're kind of off the hook because I feel like God would be like, hey, how come y'all didn't bless this meal? You'd be like, I don't know. Ask the pastor. He works for you. <laughs> okay. So we were going to talk about prayer, but I think that pretty much covers it. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> if you don't know John Christ, he does a lot of really, uh, he pokes fun at the Christian community because he's inside of it, and I just appreciate his hu sense of humor. And by the way, nothing in that is theologically correct. <laughs> In case you're wondering, that's a joke. None of it is true, right? Uh, but we, it's funny because we all wonder about the rules for prayer, not just at mealtime, but I talk to people all the time who are like, when do, like, some of you grew up, like, there's certain times you stand, certain times you kneel, certain times you sit, certain times you bow, certain times you don't, and it's not always clear what the rules are. Nobody wants to get that wrong, especially in public or in church, and we do have a lot of weird rules, if we're honest about it sometimes that aren't, some of those rules are explicit and explained. Many of them are sort of implied. You have to kind of be around a while to know them. And different churches have different rules. Have you noticed this? Some of you grew up in church traditions, Roman Catholicism and others, where there were specific rules for prayer. And if you go visit a church like that, and it's not part of your background, you feel like, I don't know what to do. And nobody wants to do that wrong. That's a little conspicuous. Uh, I have a friend who goes to our church now who grew up Roman Catholic from parochial school and CCD and uh, was there all his life, and he's been uh, walked away from his faith, and it's been coming back now. He's part of our church family. He's really growing in his faith. But I remember a number of years ago, he said, um, listen, I, I love the sermons. I, I'm growing to like the worship. At first, he thought there's too much singing, but now he's going to like the worship, right? And then he said, but the, my big hang-up is whenever we pray, I feel like I'm doing it wrong because I grew up like there's, there's ways to do it. Like, you know, nobody crosses himself here. Is that okay? He had all these hang-ups about rules, and I want to talk about that this morning. What does it mean to do prayer right or do prayer wrong? Can you do it wrong? What are the rules if there aren't, if there are some? And what can begin to happen, because most of these rules, if we're honest, or traditions are man-made. They're human traditions. They're not necessarily bad, but they're not things that God requires. And if we're not careful, we attach them to this sort of thought that if I don't get, do it right, God's not listening or it's not as effective. You know what he said? By the way, being a pastor is sort of an occupational hazard. At every family gathering, at everything we do, it's like, well, Jeff will pray, right? <laughs> I feel like I should get to decide who prays. <laughs> so what are the rules, the traditions, the things God requires for a life of prayer? The Jews of Jesus' day also had their traditions around prayer. Lots of them. But when Jesus' disciples observed him praying... In Luke chapter 11, they come to him, they, they've seen him pray, they've heard him pray, and they come to him and they say, teach us to pray that way. 
we want to pray like you, Jesus. And it wasn't because he was following all the rules that the culture had. They longed to be able to pray like he prayed. And it wasn't the magic words. Something about the way he talked to God was so compelling that they longed for it. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody like that. When you hear them pray, you can sense the closeness they have to God. And something in your heart wants the same. It's in the context of that request that Jesus gives the model we call the Lord's Prayer, which isn't the best title of that. And we'll talk about that prayer specifically and in detail next week in the sermon. But in Matthew's Gospel, before he gives the Lord's Prayer, Jesus lays out a couple of false ways of prayer, false models of spirituality, ways not to pray, if you will. And that's what we want to focus on here this morning, how not to pray. And next week we'll look into Jesus' model for prayer. So if you have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 6, we'll read just verses 5 through 8 because there's plenty in there to cover when Jesus tells us how not to pray. And by the way, before I read this and get into this, the passage right before this, Matthew 6, 1 through 4, is on giving to the needy, on giving, being generous. And so he's not changing the subject here. Actually, he's saying a very similar thing about giving. He says, don't, when you give, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. It's, it's a metaphorical way of saying um, you, you want your generosity to be coming from the heart, not for show. And he has something similar to say about prayer. He's not changing the subject. He's saying a generous life comes out of a prayerful heart. And both those things are found in what you're doing when you're not seen. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But this teaching is part of Jesus, what we would call the kingdom exposition. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. But really, it's in, in Matthew 4, verse 23, we're told that Jesus came proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. He's teaching people what life in the kingdom looks like. What, what it looks like to bring all of your life under the rule and reign of Jesus as king. And so this is, you might say, what does a prayer life in the kingdom look like? All right, verses 5 through 8. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And then he launches into the Lord's Prayer, which we'll save for next week. There's a lot here. Notice that Jesus says twice, and when you pray. He doesn't say if you pray. If you should happen to pray, someday when, he says when you pray. He seems to assume that you will, that you do. That we do pray. Barnard Research tells us that 84% of Americans say they pray regularly. Even over a third of those who profess to be atheists say they pray regularly. I find that curious. To whom it may concern? Well, you know, it's like, what do you? So there's a lot of praying going on. But Jesus says not all of it's effective. A lot of it's misguided. And he gives you two false models that are really important for us, I think really relevant for us. Martin Buber in his book, I and Thou, a Jewish scholar, writes, prayer is the involuntary reflex of the human heart. Everybody prays at some time or another. Yet for all the praying of go going on, we want to see what Jesus has to say about it. And I've heard people say to me things like, I tried praying and it didn't work. Or prayer isn't working for me. Have you heard that before? Have you felt that before? What we generally mean by that is, I prayed about X, and X didn't become Y, therefore it didn't work. I prayed about a specific thing. Like God is the genie in the bottle, and prayer is rubbing the lamp. And if I get the words right, he'll come out and do what I want him to do, but he didn't, so it didn't work. That's a f one false model of prayer. I, I was at a friend's house uh, recently, and he, I, I have a Keurig machine, and I remember when I discovered Keurig, I like coffee, and I was, I was skeptical that little plastic things could produce good coffee, but it's not bad if you're in a hurry. But I have a friend who's got this Nespresso machine. Do you know what an Nespresso machine? I'll tell you what I'm getting for Christmas. I'm getting it for my wife, for me, for Christmas. Right? <laughs> it's an Nespresso machine. It's unbelievable. Coffee. I, I would drink like four cups. like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. And I'm <laughs> driving home. Ha, ha, ha. Anyway, it makes great coffee. But if you tried to make like beef stew with an Nespresso machine, I don't think it's going to work very well. 
Why? It's not made for that. It's not its purpose. It's not how it's intended to work. And I think many of us approach prayer that way. I want prayer to do what I want. And it's not working. Jesus is saying, you used prayer to try to get something to meet your needs. You used a false model of spirituality, which is not at all what God intended or designed prayer to be. All right, first, the first thing I want you to see here is the wrong goal. The wrong goal. This is really the issue of why you pray. What's the purpose of prayer? What are you after when you pray? Look at verses 5 and 6 again. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You must not be like the hypocrites, Jesus says. This is, comes from the Greek word, the same root, same word, meaning play actor, hypocrite, one who pretends, one who plays at or acts at, pretends to be something they are not. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't be like those who are play acting at prayer. And then he says, they love to pray standing. Now, what's the typical posture for prayer in our culture? What do you do if you're praying? If I say, let us pray, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Right? Bow your head. Sometimes you fold your hands, close your eyes, you know. Or kneeling. That's how we think about prayer. Nothing wrong with that. That's more of a cultural tradition. We see it as a form of reverence before God, bowing humbly before him. It's appropriate. Do you know what the typical Jewish posture for prayer was? Exact opposite. Standing arms raised to heaven. As if I want to receive what you want to say, Father. Raising your arms in praise to pray to him. Also appropriate. So he, Jesus is saying they love to pray standing, but that was the way all faithful Jews prayed. And then he says, in the synagogues, these are Jewish houses of worship. Very appropriate place to pray. And he says on the street corners, maybe that's the problem. Street corner doesn't mean like the guy with the sandwich board jumping up and down, and you're going to hell or something like that. It means praying in the, the word actually in Greek means the marketplace, the crossroads, the place in the city center, public prayer. I was having breakfast with a guy this couple weeks ago, and our server came over, and he said, hey, we're about to pray. Would you like us to pray for you? And she said, oh, that'd be wonderful. She listed a bunch of things that were going on in her life. He said, would you like to join us? And she did. I was looking at him like, look at you, being a pastor. <laughs> public prayer, is that bad? Is Jesus condemning all public prayer? Is that the message? Thou shalt not pray out loud, ever. <laughs> no. There's nothing wrong with standing or in the synagogues or kneeling, or bowing, or praying in public? Here's the key issue, is at the end of verse 5. What does Jesus say? That they may be seen by others. That's the issue. That's the whole problem with this model of prayer. The goal is not to be heard by God, or to hear from God. It's to be seen and heard by the other people. How many of you know somebody, you know, you know somebody, who is nervous about praying out loud in public? Show of hands. You know somebody? That'd be you, right? <laughs> what? Why? My good friend Greg and I went on a missions trip to Angola Prison in Louisiana, where and he was really nervous about public prayer. It wasn't his thing. And the first thing they did was break us into groups with prisoners and pray in, in groups out loud. He's like, oh, great, you made me come to this thing. Now I have to pray with convicted felons. I thought, God has a great sense of humor. She asked Greg about that story. It changed him. Why are we don't want to pray out loud? Because people will hear us, and we're nervous that they might think we're dumb or theologically illiterate or we don't sound right or we don't pray right. Wrong audience. Wrong goal, Jesus says. And this is why, he says, if you pray to be seen and heard by people, by other people, he says, notice, he says, truly I tell you, they have received their reward. What does he mean there? Well, just what it says. If you pray so others hear you, that's what you get. If your goal is to be seen and heard by other people, then you get to be seen and heard by other people. But what do you miss out on? What you don't get is a deeper intimacy with God the Father, a deeper knowledge of his love, a deeper relationship with him, because that's not your goal. If your goal is simply to be seen by others and to impress them with your spirituality, then that's all you get. I think we should ask the question, is your goal in prayer to be seen by others or to know God? You can't do both. 
Is your goal in prayer to sound right, to get the words right so that people think you're okay? Or is it to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent? You can't do both. So what's the solution to this kind of, this false model of prayer? What's the answer? Jesus says, go into your room, close the door, and pray in secret. What's he mean there? Go into your room, close the door. Does he mean no one should ever hear you pray? If so, I'm breaking the rules every Sunday, right? We, should, we didn't even need the John Chris video, right? No prayer out loud if that's what he means. No, of course he doesn't mean that. The word for room in Greek is the word tamion. It means storeroom. In the first century, houses uh, were, they, their walls weren't, <laughs> they weren't, um, you remember the story when Jesus heals the paralytic and the people tear apart the roof and they drop their friend down? So roofs and walls in those days weren't, they were not um, thief proof. Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where thieves do not break in and steal. The way often the first century they broke in was to tear apart your wall. They're often mud bricks, easily broken into. And often in the center of your home, you'd have a room where the most treasured heirlooms and valuables were kept. No windows inside the center of the, of the house. That's the Greek word Jesus uses. Go inside to the center place, to the private room where the good stuff is kept, where the treasures are, where the wealth is. Access God's treasures in that private place. That's what he's saying. The crucial point is that nobody sees but God. Do you know what Jesus says? So powerful in such an economy of words. Then your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. They have received their reward because their goal was to be seen and heard by men. But you will get the reward your Father has for you. When you pray in private, what he's saying is no public prayer life without a private relationship with God to back it up. Sort of like every election season, you hear politicians give their speeches, and they all end with what? God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. They just say stuff like that to please the masses. We think, oh, they're very, they must be Christian, right? Just something to say. Or people that Christians, they even say, I'll pray for you. Someone says something, oh, I'll pray for you. And then you walk away and you never do. It's like the Christian way of saying, see you later. He, what Jesus is saying is not that public prayer is bad, but that we, we've turned it into this show, this, this, this superficial thing. Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who owns the only one who sees. If he's the only one who sees, what could possibly be the motivation to have private secret prayer that nobody else sees? There's only one. Nobody else sees, it's God sees, God knows. To know him and to be known by him. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. His prayer for the Ephesians, he prays that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. And then in verse 17 he prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom of revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of your heart and enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That's your goal in prayer. To know God, to know his great love for you, to grasp how much he's given you through his son Jesus. That's where the treasures are, in a private relationship with prayer. I read a book a number of years ago by Eugene Peterson called Working the Angles. And in this book, he said um, that we have a public life. He's talking to pastors, but it's applicable to all of us. A public life and a, pr and a, and a pr private life, spiritually. Our public life, and you could put almost anything, are the lines of this triangle. So you, you might say that um, uh, church attendance is, for you, a part of your public spiritual life. People see it, in other words. Maybe um, serving if you're involved in serving, people see that. Maybe um, leadership, if you lead things or you're involved in small groups or community life. You could put giving up here, but it's a little more private. But the point is, all the things about your life, spiritually speaking, that people see, the stuff you do. And he says, there's nothing wrong with those things. For me, it's preaching, teaching, leadership, right? The public stuff, what I'm doing right now. People see that, they applaud that, they admire that, or maybe they don't, but that, you get the point. He says, but this structure only holds together if you understand what the angles are. And basically he says, 
you could boil the angles down to one thing. Prayer. That it's prayer that gives your life structural integrity spiritually. Prayer holds it together. You take away those four, three angles and what happens to this structure? Collapses. And don't you see this in people's lives? I mean, I don't have to tell you if you're paying attention, there's far too many stories of Christian leaders whose lives collapse. Those are just the public ones. It's happening to those who aren't in the public eye too. They do all kinds of good things. How many times do you hear people say, but I, but I thought he seemed like such a, she seemed like such an amazing woman of faith that I never would have guessed. You have a public persona, a public life that people admire and think is one thing, but there's nothing going on inside. That's what Jesus is driving at here. What gives your life shape and integrity and strength is the private life of prayer where only God knows and only God sees and he speaks to you what you need to hear. I've, Eugene Peterson passed away recently, wrote a book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. It's encouraging to think his long obedience is done and he lived a life of spiritual integrity. And I think what Jesus is saying to us is the same thing. Okay, that's the wrong goal. Let's look at the wrong access really quickly. This is the second false model. Those who think their prayers and their words and their techniques will gain them access to God. The wrong access. Look at, look at verse 7. Jesus says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Now, the, I'm reading from the English Standard Version here. Some of you might have the New International Version or different translations uh, put this differently, the Greek phrase. So ESV says, heap up empty phrases. The NIV says, keep on babbling for that same part there. And the Greek word for babbling or empty phrases is the word batolo galeo. I know I, I didn't mispronounce that. Batolo galeo in Greek. It sounds like what it means. It's an onomatopoeic word. Babala, 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 right? Batolo galeo. It's, fu it's funny, actually. It's intentionally so. It's those who intensely repeat things. They repeat it over and over again. Thinking if they say it enough times, in the right order, with enough intensity, that God will somehow be inclined or be coerced or he'll have to hear you. He'll have to answer you. He's saying there's a fundamental misunderstanding going on here in this kind of prayer about the relationship you have with God. God is not like the capricious and unpredictable pagan deities, the gods of Greek mythology, the Roman gods, the gods of the pagan religions, the false gods. He's saying God's not like that. You don't have to convince him. You don't have to coerce him. You don't have to placate him. You don't have to get the order and the words right. He's not impressed. Do you ever think about that for a minute? This, hopefully this is encouraging to you. God's not impressed with your spiritual language. I, I, I confess that I like to watch Monty Python. So, do you remember that prayer in the, Ho in the Holy Grail when God shows up in the clouds? Oh, Lord God, you are so huge. Right? <laughs> Please do not crush us in thy mercy. <laughs> Sometimes we think of like really good prayers or like they have to have, we beseech thee. Who says beseech? Nobody. We have to say certain words a certain way for it to sound spiritual enough for God to hear. God's not impressed. He's not going, whoa, she seems to know her stuff. Better pay attention to this one. Jesus says, don't babble on. God is not listening because you get the words right. He's listening to your heart, even if you fumble for words. Romans 8 says, the Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Meaning even when you don't have words, or you fumble over them, or you don't know the right term, or you can't put it into words, God knows. He hears. He listens. Anne Lamott wrote a, a number of books, but one of her essays on prayer, she says, you could reduce my prayer life too often to th these things. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And help me, help me, help me. <laughs> How many of you can relate to that? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And help me, help me, help me, right? Jesus is saying to us, your relationship with God is not based on your performance. I hope you hear that this morning. He's saying to you, your relationship with God the Father is not based on your performance. In prayer, in your life, in any way. It's based on Jesus Christ. He's your access. 
In his book on prayer, Tim Keller compares this to praying to God as if he is your boss versus your father. You may like your boss. You may not, but let's assume you do. You may have a good relationship with your boss. You may think your boss likes you and, and respects you. That may all be true at a certain level, but fundamentally, your relationship to your boss is based on what? Performance. His opinion of the kind of job you're doing. And if you do a poor enough job in his eyes, it's going to cost you that relationship, that job. Now, we wouldn't say God is our boss, but many of us subconsciously, spiritually think that way, behave that way. As if my relationship with him is based on my performance, and I have to please him, and I have to placate him, and I have to get it right. God is not your boss. He's in charge of your life, but he's your father. Let me read to you Romans 8, verses 14 through 16. This incredible passage where the Apostle Paul is writing about the relationship we have with God as Father. He says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We are children of God. He's our father. That word Abba is the first word a, a, a little Jewish boy or girl would learn to say, like daddy in our, in our language. Papa. That's the access you have to God. Through Jesus Christ. Not, oh Lord God, you aren't so huge, please do not crush me, I'm trying to get it right. But father. My son Benjamin, my youngest of three, years ago when I was, we were on a fall retreat when I was a high school pastor, I had a bunch of students up at a camp, and I was up on stage speaking, and my, kid, my wife and kids came with me, which is always a treat for me, not so much for my wife, but when they came with me on these retreats, I had to be with them, it was just more work for her away from home. But anyway, uh, he was in the back, you know, messing around, little, I don't know, four or five years old, and he sees me get up to talk to the students, and he runs right down the center aisle up on stage, right in the middle of the talk, you know, thought nothing of it. And why should he? It's my dad. You might think, well, he shouldn't be up there, right? It's my, now, if some of you run right up here down the, to the stage right now to give me a hug, it'd be a little weird, right? <laughs> you don't have that kind of access. We don't have that kind of relationship. It's not, it's not, we don't have that. But this is my boy, right? It's my boy, my little boy. What am I going to say? Get him out of here, right? No. Come on, Benji. Come on, Benji. This is what Jesus is saying. You don't pray to God like, oh, oh. you have access. He's your father, they think they'll be heard because of their words. Jesus says, you're not heard because of your words. You're heard because of Jesus, because of what he's done on the cross. He opens the way. He's your access. This is a grace-based prayer life versus a performance-based prayer life. What Jesus is saying is you cannot pray the kind of prayer that I'm going to teach you. Remember the disciples heard Jesus pray and thought, we want to pray like that? He said, you can't pray that way. Unless you pray on family terms. Unless you can pray, talk to God on family terms. As father, you, you're not going to have the kind of prayer life that I have. You're not going to know God the way he wants you to know him. Last, the wrong audience. Both these false models have the wrong audience in one way or another, don't they? For one, it's the audience is other people's opinion of me. For the other, it's I have a false idea of who God is, like my boss. Both have the wrong audience. And Jesus says, who are you talking to? He's your father. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, I, I, I was blessed with a good earthly father. My dad was the best man in my wedding. He's not a perfect guy, but I'm so grateful for the father God gave me on earth. And I know, I know, because I talked to some of you, there are many of you here today, that's not true for you. And maybe you're thinking, well, I can't relate to God as father because I had a lousy earthly father. So my concept of God as father is messed up because of the, what, what a lousy earthly father I had. With all grace to you and sympathy and respect to that, the pain that causes you, of course you know what a good father is. Why else would you be mad at your lousy father? If you didn't have some standard of what a, what a father should be, you wouldn't have any grounds by which to be upset with the, what your father was not. 
So we don't measure our earthly, our, our, we don't measure our heavenly father by our earthly fathers. We measure our earthly fathers by our heavenly father. Jesus is saying, God is the father your heart longs for. He's the father you need, even if you weren't given on earth. The father to all of us. He's the father even to the fatherless, the Psalms tell us. Look at verse 8, last verse. Jesus says to us, your heavenly father knows what you need before you ask him. That's interesting, isn't it? Your heavenly father knows what you need before you ask him. And you might be thinking, as I was asked by a student many years ago, well, if God knows what I need before I ask him, why do I have to ask him? Have you thought that before? How many you wonder that? If he knows everything, why do I have to say it? If he just knows. It's a good question. We'll talk about it next week. No, just kidding. <laughs> all right, so uh, I'm talking to the guys in here, but I think all of you ladies and, and women uh, can relate as well. Men that are married, have you ever... Uh, Ask your wife what's wrong. Guys, have you ever picked up some signal from her that all might not be well in paradise? (laughs) It's an unspoken signal, but you can just tell. You can kind of feel it in the air, right? I I pick up those signals. Sometimes it takes a while. And then you say, what's wrong, honey? Have you guys asked that question? What does she say? (laughs) Nothing. (laughs) Don't you believe it, right? (laughs) Now, Now, she says nothing, but you know that's not true. You know nothing is not wrong. You know something is wrong. And she knows something is wrong. And you know that she knows, and she knows that you know that she knows. But nobody's talking about it, right? And you probably even know what it is. You probably even know it has something to do with you, right? (laughs) And this doesn't have to be a marriage relationship. Any relationship works like this, right? So what do you do? You take her at her word, you walk around with the nothing in the room between you. Until you sit down and talk about it, it's the chasm in your relationship. It's the gap. It's the gulf, right? But when you sit down and talk about it, it becomes the bridge by which you reconnect, even though you both know what it is. You have to say it. You have to name it. You have to bring it out. So it is with God. We don't tell him so that we inform him. God's not going, I had no idea you were dealing with all that. Why didn't you tell me? Right? (laughs) We tell him why. For us, for our sake. Because until we do, it's the chasm between us. But once we do, it's the bridge by which we, could, we, we connect. That's why he says your father knows what you need. So talk to him like his child. He knows. So say it. You're not going to surprise him. You're not going to shock him. You're not going to turn him off. He's not too busy. You have that access. Talk to him. Tell him. Philip Yancey writes this, when we share our concerns with God, they become the bridge that connects our hearts to his. But until we do, they are the gulf that separates us. Jesus' whole point is that prayer is about a relationship with God. As your father, you're his child, his son, his daughter. He loves you. He's a good father. You don't have to impress the people around you. You certainly don't have to impress God with your fancy words and getting getting the order right and the language right. He already knows. Let me read to you what C.S. Lewis writes in his book, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. Great, lesser-known book, but a great book. It's an imaginary one-way conversation. He's writing letters to a friend. It's an imaginary friend. He, he didn't have, he, maybe he had imaginary friends, but he just made this guy up for the book. And he writes, Even an intimate human friend is ill-used if we talk to him about one thing while our mind is really on another. And even a human friend will soon become aware that we're doing so. You ever have that happen? Talking to somebody and they're acting like everything's fine and you know it's not? Don't you feel like, just tell me. I'm here for you. Tell me what's going on with you. It's exactly how God is with us. Lewis writes, how important, he writes this, we must lay before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us. If it's in your thoughts, then it ought to be in your prayers. Sometimes we think, i got to lay aside my rest of my life and now get spiritual, (laughs) right? God's your Father. He knows. So, friends, here's our prayer challenge this week. I don't know what your prayer life is like. Some of you have mature and growing prayer life. Some of you, maybe this is new for you. But I'm going to give you a little challenge. I'm going to take it as well. Every day this week, for however long, it could be two minutes, could be 20 minutes, could be half an hour, 
could be 30 seconds. Every day this week, set aside some specific time to pray privately. Meal times don't count, right? And before you say a word to God, think about him as your father. Pause and just say to yourself, God, you're my father. And think about all that that means, all you long for, all you want from a father, all that he is to you. And then lay before him what's in you. Pretty simple, really. Maybe you're a journaler, write this out. Just say, God, you're my father. Maybe you make a list of all the qualities of a father that God is for you. But before you say a word to him, but before, thank you, thank you, thank you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, help me, help me, help me, right? Just pause and think about God as your father and how much he loves you and the kind of access you have to him. You can run right into his arms. That's what Jesus is saying. What you heard me praying to his disciples, what you longed for was not the words, it was the relationship. And that's what I want to give you. Let's pray. God, you are our Father. For some of us, that conjures up sweet memories and images. Others of us have pain. But you are the Father all of our hearts long for. You love us unconditionally. We don't have to try to impress you. We don't have to try to get your attention. You're always attentive, always available. You know us better than we know ourselves. So help us to lay aside our false ideas of prayer and just speak to you from our hearts this day, this week, and all our lives. We want our lives to have structural integrity, Lord, to hold together because of the relationship we have with you. We thank you that you have made this possible through your son, Jesus. We pray in his name.